Hello, I'd like to welcome you to this lesson on constructivism and the Christian teacher. Some of you may have heard of the idea of constructivism in education, or you may not have. So we're going to talk about that today and see what it means, and especially how we can think of it from a Christian perspective. So first, let's think about this, just what is constructivism? Well, here's one definition where they say learning means constructing, creating, inventing, and developing our own knowledge. This is from a very helpful book, which I can recommend to you by Bruce Marlowe and Marilyn Page, Creating and Sustaining the Constructivist Classroom. Uh, if you would like to read more, you, uh, I would encourage you to get this book and read it because it's very helpful. I think it gives a lot more detail than what we're able to go into today. But this is the basic idea of co constructing, creating, inventing, developing our own knowledge. Now, initially as you see that, you might start thinking, and you probably have heard, some non-Christian perspectives or some non-Christian use of this. For example, you may have heard the idea that students are making their own truth, that in constructivism it's a matter of students just constructing and deciding for themselves what is true. Another non-Christian idea is that they create meaning for themselves, that basically we are confronted with a meaningless universe and everything around us uh, is just void of any meaning and our job is to figure out or to decide what things mean or what the meaning of life is. Another non-Christian concept is the idea of a denial of absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. It's just, okay, you decide what's true for you. I'll decide what's true for me. And we're all happy that way. Another non-Christian idea is the, just this complete relativism. That is that, again, what's true for you might not be true for me, and it doesn't matter, but we're all just kind of happy and going along with our different views of truth. Now, as Christians, we would disagree with these points. Uh, but I'd like to show you how we can see this in a Christian perspective. First, we have to realize the foundation. God has established absolute truth for us. There is not a, uh, we don't decide truth for ourselves. God is the standard of truth. We're told in scripture where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, we have to realize that God is the one who has established absolute truth. Next, God has revealed this truth to us. He has given us his word. He has given it his creation so that we see God's truth. We cannot just ignore that or think, well, God might know what truth is, but we have no idea what it is. No, God has revealed truth to us. But here's something we sometimes forget in this. We don't understand that truth perfectly or completely. Even though God has revealed truth to us and uh, he, has, he knows all truth, yet we often misunderstand it or we don't understand it completely. We are still learning about the truth of God throughout history. And so it's not just a done deal. It's not where uh, the teacher says, I know the truth and I'm going to pass that truth along to you, it's where the teacher is thinking, well, I know a portion of truth, perhaps, and I want to see how you as students can begin to perceive truth as well. And so this idea of finding truth is a lifelong process. It's something we have to engage in throughout our lives. It's not something that just comes in a neat package and say, okay, here is truth. Obviously, in one sense, it is a neat package. We have the Word of God, which is true, but when we talk about our understanding or our comprehension of that truth, that discovery of truth is going to be a lifelong process. And then another idea here is that Scripture seems to present a pattern of what is called revelation response. That is, God speaks to man, and man responds. There is a uh, Bible curriculum, in fact, that was developed around this whole pattern. But this idea of revelation response. Uh, for example, we see this in creation. You have the cultural mandate. 
God told Adam and Eve to have dominion over the earth. But the thing was, God didn't come to Adam and Eve and say, okay, here's the earth. I want you to leave it. I've given it to you perfect. You just preserve it. No, God gave Adam and Eve the earth. He gave them the raw materials. They were expected to develop it, to reshape it, to uh, improve on it in a way. And notice something interesting. As you read scripture, if you look at the whole Bible, the whole story of the scripture, you notice the creation begins in a garden, but it ends in a city, the New Jerusalem. That is, God gave man the building blocks. He gave him the raw materials. But man's response was to develop a city, a New Jerusalem. There's to be progress throughout history. God, We don't just take what God gives us and present that back to him. Instead, we take what God has given to us and develop it to present it back to him. And so overall throughout scripture, we see the pattern that God takes the initiative and man responds creatively. We don't just parrot back what God has told us. Instead, we take what God has told us and we implement it and we expand on it and develop it in our own lives. Well, I think this is a pattern for a Christian view of constructivism in that we are taking the truth that God has given to us and then we rework it. We add to it, uh, not in a sense of adding new revelation, but we add the implications of it and so on. So I think this helps us as Christians where we can start having a perspective on this. So now, let's see how we might apply this to the classroom. First, we have to realize that the teacher is the one who initiates the action. Okay, We're not talking about a student-centered classroom. Some constructivists will advocate this. Uh, some will say that we should let the students decide what they're going to learn and let them decide what they're going to deal with and how they're going to go about it and so on. We are not a student-centered classroom. Uh, the teacher, under the guidance of the school system, sets out the curriculum. The teacher decides what the objectives of the lesson are going to be. The teacher gives parameters for activities and so on. Students are sinful. So we can't just say, well, let's leave it up to the students and let them do what they want to do because they'll make good choices. As Christians, we can't go along with that. So it's a teacher-directed, a teacher-governed classroom. But realize now that we want the students to respond creatively to us. Honestly, when we're teaching, uh, unless you're on a very low level, if you're in first or second grade or something, you want your students to basically repeat back what you teach them. If you teach them the multiplication facts, you want them just to repeat the multiplication facts back to you. Uh, but in general, once you get above these very basic levels, when students respond, you want them to respond creatively. If our students in a history class, for example, if all they can do is just repeat back to the teacher what the teacher has said, we would probably say the students really haven't learned the material. Instead, we want them to take the information we give them, we want them to take the learning and rework it and reshape it. We want them to put it in their own words. We want them to make it theirs. Uh, we talk about this regularly where we want them to possess it. We want them to own their learning. And so we shouldn't be satisfied if students just repeat back to us what we have told them. And so this is the idea of active learning. We don't want our students to be passive receptors of information. We want them to be actively involved in their learning. We don't want our students just to sit there and soak up and just be passive and wait for us to tell them what they need to know. We want them to be actively involved. Now think about this in your own background. Think about things that you remember years later from your time in school. If you think back to your time in high school or in college, the things you most remember are more likely to be those things that you did your research papers, if you did a project. Uh, I think back to uh, Spanish class when I was in high school and one of the few things I remember from that class was doing a project with several others on uh, Hispanic music. Uh, so that's something that I remember, not the teacher lectures, not the outlines, not the notes. And I think that's going to be the case for most of us. Uh, the things that we are actively involved in, those things that we take a 
real role in doing and dig out for ourselves those are the a biblical role of model model of learning is going to involve students taking this active role in their learning and discovering and finding out information this is what i mean by constructivism where their students are active where they are given the information and allowed to find it out and to discover it and to rework it for themselves so why is this effective why do i promote this idea well there's several several statistics one of them is that in 90 days students will forget 90 percent of everything they've been told and you know this that you can have a fine lecture for your students and the next day if you tried to review what they remembered it might be 10 percent of what you said uh, they're just not going to remember it and this is just the way we all are if we're just thinking about what we remember from what we've been told we tend to forget 90% of it within 90 days. Research on how the brain works has been very fascinating in the last uh, decade or so, where we learn how our brains operate. And what we've learned is that active learning is something that fits with the way our brains work. As we learn new material, we take it in, we work it, we relate it to other bits of information that we have learned we see how it fits with previous learning we start relating it to one to other bits of information and then it becomes a part of our mind and so active learning is something that supports this it promotes this idea of the students taking the information in for themselves finding it out and relating it to what they already know constructivism uh, then shows that students will learn more when they're actively engaged in their own learning. That is, they're going to learn deeper. It's not just going to be superficial facts, but they're going to have more in-depth knowledge of what they have learned. And it's going to lead to higher order thinking. If you're into Bloom's taxonomy, you're going to think about the higher order questions there. And active learning, constructivism, is going to lead to that. Now, by the way, if you read the constructivist literature, for example, the book by Marlowe and Page that I recommend, you'll come across statements such as, each of us constructs our own meaning and learning about issues. Okay, again, remember that as Christians, we would say that God has established meaning. He has interpreted reality properly and truly. And so, in this sense, we would disagree with constructivists. But as I've read through the literature about constructivism, I think when they talk about constructing our own meaning, what they're actually saying is, a better word would be meaningful, or how does this not learning relate to other things I know? How can I make it meaningful for me? So that it's more than just knowing the facts that um, Columbus discovered America, but how is that meaningful to me? What's the relevance? What's the importance of it? That's what constructivism is actually saying, I believe, when they talk about constructing our own meaning. It's going to be that a student has discovered and come up with that meaningfulness, that connection for themselves. So, think, think about this. Okay? Which of these is more important if you're thinking about teaching? Is it more important to dispense thousands of bits of information the student won't remember anyway, or to have students work on one or a few topics or problems in depth that involve learning those bits of information? We're not denying the need to know the information, but that it will help them develop their own sustainable knowledge and understanding. That is, they learn the facts. They still have to learn the content. They learn the stuff but as they learn it they put it in a framework so that they can remember it it's sustainable it's applicable they're able to use that information and to understand it that i think is what we're after rather than just saying okay we've presented a bunch of stuff to our students now a sample activity something that might be done in a classroom if i were teaching a u.s history class for example one way that this might be done 
uh, history classes especially are good for this because you have uh, document-based questions. If you teach an AP history class, that's a big part of a AP history class, is document-based questions. That is, you give the students original source documents, things from the time period, and then ask them to draw conclusions from those documents, from that information. So, for example, I might give the students uh, several paragraphs from a Lincoln-Douglas debate um, and give them a paragraph or two of what Abraham Lincoln said, give them a paragraph or two of Stephen Douglas's responses, and have, have them read over this and uh, read through the material, read through their arguments as they said them. You know, without trying to pre-interpret, just give them the information. Now, before this, of course, they will have studied the background to it. They will have known the historical information leading up to the debates and the issues that were going on in the country at the time. But now they have a chance to, okay, let's see what these people actually said and draw some conclusions from it. So then after they've read a few paragraphs, I might ask them these questions. When they read Douglas's arguments, for example, I might say, okay, based on what you see of Lincoln, how would Lincoln answer Douglas's argument? Okay, if we're talking about slavery in the states, how would Lincoln answer what Douglas said? How would Douglas answer Lincoln arg arguments? And again, these are not just where we're asking them to come up with things out of thin air, but if you're going to say that Douglas would answer Lincoln in a certain way, how do you know that? What evidence do you see in his responses or in his debate uh, answers or in other materials you might have read? How can you show that Douglas would have said what you say he would have said? And then an application. How would these arguments relate to the pro-life issue today? See, because as they're talking about states' rights or individual rights, you get into the question, well, we have the uh, pro-life argument. Uh, how does it apply today? How can you take the same arguments? So the students begin thinking through what Lincoln and Douglas said, but then they're applying it to their own culture. They're applying it to their own world. And this helps them to learn the material in a very effective way. So, here's one way that you can implement this. How you might think, okay, how can I do active learning in my classroom? Well, first, think about what your learning objectives are. What do you want your students to know and be able to do when they are finished? This is something I've dealt with in another video on developing effective lessons. But you think backwards in a way. You think about what your goal is. What do you want the students to leave your class knowing or being able to do. So if you want them to understand uh, the views of Lincoln and Douglas and you want them to really understand that, you think, okay, there's my learning objective. So you're not emphasizing only what facts they should know, but also their higher order skills. And remember, you think about this in terms of not what am I going to teach the students, but rather you ask the question, what are the students going to learn? That's a subtle difference, but it's important because what you're going to teach just talks about what you are doing. If you think, what are my students going to learn? That drives you into what's the best way they can learn it. So instead of thinking, how can I teach Johnny long division? You think, what's the best way for Johnny to learn long division. That might be a lecture, it might be a demonstration, it might be providing him with manipulatives that he can use. There's a number of different ways, but when you focus on the best way for Johnny to learn division, it changes your thinking so that you start realizing how is it going to be most effective for the students. So you think about your learning objectives, then you think, how can they demonstrate this? How can they prove they've learned what you want? What are some possible assessments of this? And don't just think of tests. That's traditionally the way we think, especially on the high school level. That's one way to figure out if they've learned what you want them to, but there are alternative ways to prove that they've, what they've learned. I had a teacher once when he was teaching Hamlet in high school literature, 
He would have the students produce videos. They would get into groups and work on this. This was a project that would take a good deal of time, I mean, several weeks' time. But they were to produce a video. They were to take a scene from Hamlet, and they were to redo that scene in some contemporary setting. For example, it might be in a gang. It might be uh, in Central America. It might be on a basketball court but some way where they take some scene from Hamlet and show it in context of some other setting. Well, the idea is the teacher wanted the students to learn the meaning of the play, not just to be able to pair it back or not just to be able to answer sim simple comprehension questions, but rather what was Shakespeare really saying here? And so their videos had to explain how they illustrated some real aspect of the play. It wasn't just a fun type thing or you know, being cute, but they needed to be able to show, okay, this illustrates the point that Shakespeare was getting at here. And what you want to do also is you want to come up with several ways that students can prepare for this demonstration. You might say, okay, I want you to be able to show me that you understand what Shakespeare was saying in Hamlet. Now, what are some ways you can do this? How can you do this? Maybe it would be through a video. Maybe it might be, maybe it's just them writing a research paper. Maybe another student says, well, I can compose some music to illustrate this. But you give them the opportunity to sh say, here is how I can demonstrate that I've learned the material. And again, I realized that as teachers were all busy, we, on the high school level especially, we might have five, four or five different classes to prepare for, and thinking about a constructivist way to teach our students might be overwhelming for all of those classes. So just think about one unit. Maybe you teach your class in a traditional way, a lecture way, going through outlines, and then at one point in the unit, in the uh, lesson in the class. You do a lesson based on some of these principles and you have the students engage in some type of project where they're doing some type of active learning. Now, as you start implementing this, uh, where there's a lot of project-based learning, uh, especially a lot of this is going to be group-based projects, you're probably going to hear some objections, particularly from parents. So let's look at these. One of these is that you're wasting time. I mean, why spend time letting the students discover stuff for themselves and figure it out for themselves? It's quicker just to tell them. Why have them reinvent the wheel? I've heard this before. So from Marlowe and Page, they say, they answer it and say, although some teachers call traditional education methods efficient in that they that is, the teachers, can transmit much material to students in a short amount of time, they do not consider how ineffective this delivery is in terms of students' understanding, retention, and application. How do you know if students understand concepts, issues, ideas, and problems? If a student repeats information, as often happens in a traditional class, it doesn't mean she understands anything or can apply this information in any way. It doesn't demonstrate learning or understanding. It simply demonstrates ability to repeat information." End quote. You see, the idea is, if you're thinking about wasting time, well, sure, you can pour out a lot of stuff to the students through a lecture method. But if your goal is that the students actually learn the material, you might start realizing that just relying on lecture is inefficient that you actually are wasting time because you're spending a lot of time in class talking and going over things that the students are not going to remember. So you think, okay, let me realize how I'm wasting time now. How can I be more effective in the students actually learning the material? A second objection. We're paying you good money to teach the kids. I don't want other kids teaching my kid. Okay, this is if you have uh, the idea of group learning and where a group does a project and presents it to the other rest of the class. 
Okay, now it's true. You are getting paid. I don't know if I'd say good money if you're in a Christian school, but you're getting paid to teach the kids, and the parents don't want other children teaching their child. But remember, the flip side of teaching is learning. The goal of teaching is learning, and what we're talking about here is a more effective way of achieving that goal. Sure, you have a few especially bright students. The teacher can just lecture rapid fire and the student will grasp and understand the information. But that's not the case with most students. Even the bright students, too, will learn it better and be able better to use the information if they're actively involved in their learning. So, again, you're thinking what is best for the student's learning, not what is the best way, what can I do to teach the students. A third objection, especially this is true if you do the uh, procedure of having a group project uh, where, for example, you say, okay, this group is going to work on chapter one, this group is going to work on chapter two, and then you present your material to the rest of the class and expect the whole class to know all the material. Parents might say, well, okay, the kids in that group learned that material well. The kids who study, who worked on chapter two in their group, they learned chapter two well, but they don't know anything about chapters one and three, and the other kids in the class don't know chapter two. Uh, so this is where you take active and constructivist learning to the next step. That is, the students in the group not only learn the material themselves, but they need to learn how to lead a learning experience that involves the rest of the class, how they can get the rest of the class actively involved. You can explain to the students that they're now the experts in this topic, and their job is not only to be the experts, but they're to think of an activity they can conduct with the rest of the class that will get the rest of the class actively involved in learning the topic. You see, you teach them how to be active teachers. So uh, this is going the next step where it's not just the students in the group learning the material, but they learn how to present it effectively to the rest of the class. Okay, fourth, you might think that you're just doing, that this is just for entertainment. Parents might say, okay, well, yeah, it's fun for the kids to do videos, but I'm not sending them there to have fun. I'm sending them there to learn. And when I was in school, we had to work hard at our learning. Okay. Now, for one thing, since when do learning activities have to be miserable and dull? True, there are going to be things that take hard work to master. It's, there's no way that you're going to make all learning fun and enjoyable for all the students. There are going to be some things that just have to buckle down and master, and it's going to be hard. But in general, don't place things that are enjoyable and learning as opposite ends of the spectrum. A well-designed learning activity may be enjoyable and may also be effective in having the students learn the material. Besides, going back to the idea of brain research, that tells us that when students are emotionally involved, that is, positively emotionally involved in learning, they remember it better than when they're neutral or negative emotionally. There are small experiments with things when humor is involved, for example. When you have students laughing, they will tend to remember what you talked about. When you think back to the sermon that you heard uh, in church this past week, if the t preacher told a joke, an effective joke, you probably remember the joke. You might have a hard time remembering what the point of the sermon was. But the idea is, with the humor, it excites certain areas of the brain that also help with memory. And so if you can have your students positively involved, if they enjoy what they're doing, if there are positive emotions, that helps them remember the material better. On the other hand, negative emotions, fear or boredom, these actually get in the way of memory. The chemicals that are involved in the brain when you have these types of negative emotions tend to shut down memory. And so if the students are bored, it becomes less and less possible for them to learn the material. So these are just some objections to this whole idea of active learning, of constructivism. So, in conclusion, 
let's think about what Marlowe and Page say about this. They say in their book, constructivist active learning programs not only are more engaging, but also promote elaborate knowledge construction, encourage empowered, informed, and independent thinking and doing, foster deeper understanding of concepts, nourish more enduring learning, and lead to greater command and ownership of content. Now this sounds to me an awful lot like what we as Christian educators should want. It sounds like the students having dominion over their learning. They're able to think for themselves. They have a deeper understanding of the material. It lasts longer and they're in command of it. They're able to use it effectively. So, I hope this has been helpful to you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at the address there. Uh, I would look forward to hearing from you, and I hope this will be helpful to you in your teaching. Thank you.